The final Duncan Idaho is the latest in a number of golas created by the Bene Chilax for the Sisterhood in the final two Dune novels. The Bene Chilax has seeded in the Idaho golas manipulations of the original's genes with some hidden purpose that is to be used at a given time. As such, though they continue to produce Duncan Idahos for the Sisterhood, they periodically assassinate them, so that this hidden purpose may be unleashed at a given time. The final Duncan Idaho is saved from such a fate and has the singular memories of the original Idaho restored with the assistance of Miles Tegg. However, this Idaho Gola goes through a second period of awakening to his original self that no other Gola of his kind has managed. The hidden purpose implanted by the Tleilaxu is to counter the sexual weapon of the Honoured Matres, with which they so readily and easily enslave men. Idaho has been conditioned with responses that are not just a match for the Honoured Matres' sexual techniques, they far surpass them. When an Honoured Matre attempts to enslave Duncan in such a manner, she finds the tables turned against her. Abruptly, the flame engulfed his mind. Hidden places within him came alive. He saw red capsules like a string of gleaming sausages passing before his eyes. He felt feverish. He was an engorged capsule. Excitement flaring throughout his awareness. Those capsules! He knew them. They were himself. They were... All of the Duncan Idahos, original and the serial Golas flowed into his mind. They were like bursting seed pods denying all other existence except themselves. He saw himself crushed beneath a great worm with a human face. Damn you, Leto! Crushed and crushed and crushed, time and again. Damn you! Damn you! Damn you! He died under a Sardaukar sword. Pain exploded into a bright glare swallowed by darkness. He died in a thopter crash. He died under the knife of a fish speaker assassin. He died and died and died. And he lived. The memories flooded him until he wondered how he could hold them all. The sweetness of a newborn daughter held in his arms. The musky odours of a passionate mate. The cascade of flavours from a fine Danian wine. The punting exertions of the practice floor. The Exlottle Tanks. He remembered emerging time after time, bright lights and padded mechanical hands. The hands rotated him and, in the unfocused blurs of the newborn, he saw a great mound of female flesh, monstrous in her almost immobile grossness. A maze of dark tubes linked her body to giant metal containers. Axlottle Tank? He gasped in the grip of the serial memories that cascaded into him. All of those lives. All of those lives. Now, he remembered what the Tleilaxu had planted in him. The submerged awareness that awaited only this moment of seduction by a Bene Gesserit imprinter. But this was Morbella, and she was not Bene Gesserit. She was here, though, ready at hand, and the Tleilaxu pattern took over his reactions. Idaho senses more than just the use of these sexual techniques stored in his subconscious. Realising that the Bene Tylax had intended him to kill the Honoured Matres when sexual conditioning was used against him. Instead, Idaho resists this, possibly because the act of attempted imprinting has fully restored all of his memories from every incarnation he has lived through both as the original Idaho and the numerous Golas that have followed. In that sense, Idaho has become a new kind of Kwisatz Sadarak. Only his memories are not of the male or female line, simply his own over thousands of years. He also possesses a limited form of prescient vision, though he himself does not have the Atreides ability to remain hidden from prescience. The Bene Gesserit, having decided that Duncan was suitable bait for the Honoured Matres, now realise his worth as a weapon against them. He is taken back to Rakus, where he will train men in the sexual techniques he has had implanted in his consciousness by the Bene Tleilax. Duncan, however, cannot be shielded by those with prescient vision, such as guild navigators, and as such, must remain on board the no ship, a virtual prisoner. He is also tasked with returning the memories of Miles Tegg to his newly created Gola body. 
As Duncan is confined to his ship, he begins to have prescient visions of an old man and woman who appear in a kind of shimmering net and seem to be working in a garden. He was aware when the vision came that he was not really seeing a net. His mind translated what the senses could not define. A shimmering net undulating like an infinite borealis. Then the net would part and he would see the two people, man and woman. How ordinary they appeared, and yet extraordinary. A grandmother and grandfather in antique clothing. Bib coveralls for the man and a long dress with headscarf for the woman. Working in a flower garden. He thought it must be more of the illusion. I am seeing this but it is not really what I see. They always noticed him eventually. He heard their voices. There he is again, Marty, the man would say, calling the woman's attention to Idaho. I wonder how it is he can look through, Marty asked once. Doesn't seem possible. He's spread pretty thin, I think. Wonder if he knows the danger. Danger? That was the word that always jerked him out of the vision. The elderly couple have what Idaho calls a godlike stability, and are aware of Idaho watching them, demanding on one occasion that he stop spying on them. Idaho has a number of recurring visions of the elderly couple, who we later learn are called Daniel and Marty. As Duncan escapes Chapter House with Shiana, Miles Tegg, the Jews of Gamu, and the last Tleilaxu master, Skytail, they are observed by the mysterious entities of Marty and Daniel, who joke about their escape. With Frank Herbert's death, the mysteries of Chapter House Dune's cliffhanger remained unanswered for over 20 years. The conclusion to the Dune series by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson reveal that Daniel and Marty are in fact machine intelligence, and that the great enemy that has pursued the honoured mattress from the edges of the scattering was in fact the return of the machines that humanity fought during the Butlerian Jihad. Duncan proves to be the ultimate Kwisatz Haderach, and is able to eventually bring about the end of Kralizek by merging in symbiosis with the machine intelligence and ending the conflagration between humanity and machine. This ultimately echoes the words of the unnamed philosopher in Erewhon, who notes that machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, and that man is a machinate animal. Despite being unfinished, Herbert's exploration of evolution successfully exploits the ideas of Samuel Butler and Erewhon in two ways. They provide a strong sense of verisimilitude by creating a believable historic framework to the Dune series, based on Butler's projected time frame for machine evolution. Additionally, they also create a substantial and complex framework to house Herbert's own ideas on evolution. Herbert's lasting contribution to science fiction in the series is one that explores fully the many possibilities that evolution may present to the future of humanity, rather than examining any one particular strand. The notion that humanity's evolution can be linked to that of machines comes from Butler's curious observations based on Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and is one that is often considered in science fiction, though seldom to such a degree of investigation. As technology continues to embed itself in every aspect of our lives during this information age, even scientists speculate now that machines are evolving exponentially in their development, rather than in a measured linear fashion. It is difficult to measure Herbert's attitudes towards artificial intelligence in relation to science fiction writing in a post-internet, post-cyberpunk era. This is because artificial intelligence remains a shadowy figure of evil in the Dune series, never actually tangible until the appearance of Daniel and Marty. It does however keep alive the ideas of Butler, who was quite possibly the first science fiction writer to speculate on machine intelligence and evolution, and we can see this certainly in works such as the Matrix trilogy, which shows a startling resemblance between Paul Atreides and the character of Neo. The complexity and depth with which Herbert presents his outlook on evolution is still worthwhile, despite the reader having to guess for a long time what any given conclusion may have been. Whether this conclusion is satisfying or not, the completion of the work by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson 
provides answers to these questions that, based upon Frank Herbert's notes, at least hold merit in examining the direction that evolution was taking within the work. Evolution is a process by which life moves forward, adapts to new situations, and either flourishes or falls into extinction. Herbert saw evolution as ultimately part of the systems and subsystems that govern the natural universe from the human perspective. As such, this theme permeates all of the Dune series to such a degree that its interactions within the other major themes are of paramount importance to understanding the Dune series as a whole. In addition, carrying on Samuel Butler's questioning regarding the nature of machine evolution, Herbert successfully shows that humanity's dominant evolutionary trait lies in our ability to make tools. As the machines we create evolve, so do we, and that ultimately human evolution may well be helped or hindered by our relationship with the tools that we create, and the degree to which we rely upon them. With that in mind, I will now look at what Herbert considered to be initially the dominant theme of the Dune series, that of the catastrophic hero, and consider what happens to a society who follows such an individual who is not a normal man, but is in fact a superman. This superman is not just an individual created by the process of evolution, but a person bred through the necessity to escape the crutches created by humanity's reliance on highly evolved machines, which ultimately become detrimental to mankind's survival. <laughs>